with us this morning, we have Chair Gomez with House File 5336. I understand you have an A1 amendment. Would you like to discuss the A1 amendment? I'll uh, move that the bill be before us and the amendment be before us. Great. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, members of the committee, for having me this morning. Um, so the A1 amendment is um, a section that is of concern to this community, com or committee. The reason that we're in front of you today is because of duties um, for the Office of the State Auditor included in the changes to the local sales tax um, provisions, which is which is um, what House File 5336 is. Um, so the A1 adds um, a piece about annual financial reporting to, uh, sorry, I believe it's to section um, seven, section five, sorry. Um, and so that was at the request of the Office of the State Auditor to, to add this uh, annual financial reporting language. Thank you. Um, members, do you have any questions about the A1? All those, go ahead. Oh, just, just uh, Madam Chair will note that uh, this was, we're, we're, you're basically hearing a clone of the um, local sales tax uh, bill, and this was included in an author's amendment that we adopted in taxes. So we don't need to adopt it, is that what you're telling me? I, I wanted to put it in front of the committee because um, the OSA changes are sort of of concern, so yeah. wanted to make sure we brought this, but right. just so everybody knows. All right, and just to be clear, our intent is to lay this bill over. Right, so, okay. Members, any questions to the A1? Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one. So, uh, and Representative Gomez, good morning. Thank you. Um, morning. So, you're intending that each calendar year, I mean, most city, most, or so every calendar year, regardless of where they are in this in this sales tax collection, they're to report on the capital, um, they're to report to the auditor on the capital projects that these funds are being used for every every year that's the that's what the is that correct chair gomez madam chair representative nadeau yes okay thank you thank you any further questions to the a1 seeing none all those in favor of adoption of the a1 please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed the motion prevails and the a1 is adopted <clears throat> uh, you know chair gomez just to make this clean and neat why don't we just re-refer this bill back to your committee and then it's all in your jurisdiction what do you think about that um, Madam Chair, I mean, I, I, I would say it's up to you. Um, the bill is where it needs to be in my committee, so there's no need, certainly, to re-refer it to me because this is a clone perfect. of the original bill, so. Okay, just trying to make things neat and tidy. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, to the bill as amended, please. Um, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm just, I'm not sure what the convention of your committee is. In taxes, we kind of like don't constrain our conversation to <laughs> the jurisdiction of the committee necessarily, but yeah. you know, I'm, I'm happy to just kind of talk about the auditor requirements or, or to go into the overall bill, it's up to you. No, you can just talk about the auditor's requirements. That's Great, um, yeah, so uh, the, the um, House File 5336 makes changes, just you know, high level makes changes to requirements for local sales taxes. It allows local municipalities to, to um, without coming um, in front of the legislature to put local sales tax proposals in front of their communities, you know, for a ref via referendum. Um, so the issues in front that are in the, in the jurisdiction of the, um, of state gov are just, you know, the, the uh, we basically ask, right now we have a system where, um, you know, the legislature kind of oversees in a manner of speaking the local sales taxes mm -hmm. and it kind of politicizes the um, issue in a way and so you know the, the state auditor has experience doing um, sort of some some kind of uh, oversight of the requirements for tax increment financing um, and so the idea was just sort of to give them some authority to oversee it so that it took uh, some of the legislative uh, kind of political aspects out of it okay. so um, I have on my list that the auditor wants to testify if um, auditor Blaha would please come forward at this time Good 
Welcome to the committee auditor Blahoff. You'll state your name for the record and present your testimony, please. Thank you, Chair Cleveland and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Julie Blaha and I'm your state auditor. And uh, here to speak to uh, the parts of this, uh, the bill that applies to us. Uh, we do appreciate how important local sales tax is as a tool and to all of you. And so we appreciate the effort to basically help simplify the process where we can. Um, to go to a vote and to give you the data you need to make long going decisions about this. So uh, after talking with the authors, Commissioner Mar Marquardt, watching the working group a bit this summer. Um, so I believe what you're looking for is this uh, basically certification, kind of like our assessments um, for local government aid and county program aid and some TIF reviews. Um, and then also data collection similar uh, to what we do with our city, county, town uh, budget and financial reports. So so that's kind of how we structured this change, that that would be uh, the idea. So as we work, and we are continuing to work through this, of course, our goal is to make it uh, as simple as possible, as um, clean as possible. Um, we also could imagine that uh, over the next few years, we would expect that this would be also refined as you see the data that we would share with you. Is that the data you want? Do we need to change that? Kind of like we do again with, with TIF, with pension, with all of that stuff, we come back to you to refine as we go to get you what you need. Um, uh, as far as costs for this role, uh, we're, we're, again, we've been working on our estimate and these discussions have been really helpful <laughs> to, that, uh, to that process. So in form, we're gonna be asking just for a, a direct appropriation for FTE uh, and, uh, and uh, instead of a percentage. Uh, so it's a little more consistent since this, we anticipate the scale of this to, uh, to get to require some increase in staffing, but not uh, something where it's going to really change that much based on the size of the, um, uh, of the expenditures uh, or the rev, I'm sorry, the revenue uh, generation. Um, so with that, again, we know it's an important tool and we're, we're ready to, we're here to, to support your efforts uh, any way we can. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask a really broad question? Yes. And Chair Gomez, I apologize, I didn't ask you this privately before. So if we have a state auditor who is really opposed to local taxes, mm -hmm. would this bill mean that it would be difficult to, for a municipality to pass a local sales tax? Yeah, I would actually just pass that to Auditor Blaha. Auditor Blaha. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Cleveland. Great question. And I think that is the important part of this, how we build this structure. Uh, the structure needs to be, you know, we, we the kind of work we want to do uh, in these kind of things is we have a tight standard and we follow the standard, right? So the stricter and the tighter we make the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the requirements in this bill, the easier our job is. And I think where you would see it, I, ideally it wouldn't be uh, that so much we're saying you don't get to do this, as much we're saying you'll have to go back to the legislature. Because again, there's always gonna be another option uh, for someone if they don't agree uh, with uh, our assessment. Uh, but I think, uh, again, that really is a key to get these definitions right. Uh, just like we do at TIF, doesn't matter what we think about TIF, we follow the law and we would follow what you set in front of us. And that's that's the whole goal here. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Cleborn. So uh, in section five, subdivisions one and two is really like where the kind of um, oversight and reporting um, kind of uh, portions are for the Office of the State Auditor. And really we're not actually asking the auditor to make like, I don't think anything that you could describe as a judgment call. It's basically like certifying that the projects meet the statutory requirements. Mm -hmm. And so so I don't know if, if, if the auditor thinks there's like some level of discretion associated with the, with the um, kind of oversight that we're asking them to do. But from my reading, it's pretty, it's like a pretty kind of straightforward, like does it meet this list? But thank you. Thank you very much. Auditor Blaha, mm -hmm. did you want to say something else? Thank you, yes, Chair Cleveland. Uh, our goal is to not have that uh, so as we're and we're continuing to work on this as it's laid over also to tighten up any language uh, particularly around regionality where we want it to be just this is a region this isn't boom um, we do not want discretion um, uh, we appreciate that you love that and we're let we're happy to let you have it thank you very much uh, auditor Blaha and chair Gomez it's just important that we get that on the public mm -hmm. record so that was the point of my question members do you have any questions uh, representative Harder Thank you, Chair Cleveland and Representative Gomez. Uh, the bill seems to limit as to what projects can be 
uh, used for the local sales tax, and uh, I'm just wondering why it's not expanded to use some of the things that are really important to local jurisdictions, like the flood mitigation, uh, water problems, or wastewater treatment plants. Why was the scope just these few projects? Chair Gomez. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Harder. So there were some um, changes. This the the use of local sales taxes has been a, the topic of discussion at the legislature for many years, and the what kind of uses are allowed for, you know, um, the the applications of local sales taxes uh, to some extent have changed. And for example, I mean, in 2021, we passed. I think the reason that some of those um, items are not included uh, is because in 2021 we passed sort of a, a definition of a kind of regional capital project which included um, as I recall a, a single building being sort of one of the requirements or a, a regional park and trail was also included but um, you know that sort of definition excluded some of I think some of those wastewater and water quality um, treatment uh, facilities um, so the, this bill does, uh, limit what is kind of what cities can use local sales taxes for by right without coming to the legislature to ask for a dispensation. And those were, you know, in part based on recommendations that came out of a task force that met over the summer last year. They came out with a list of recommendations of kinds of facilities. I didn't include all of those. Um, in my initial proposal, um, you know, there's kind of been a long uh, conversation about what constitutes regionality, what constitutes a capital project. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, I guess, you know, local sales taxes for decades, we didn't grant them to anybody. Um, you know, the, the big, the uh, cities of the first class had them and for some reason, Mankato, which I don't exactly understand, but that was on the list. And then, you know, for, for literally decades, because, you know, we restricted the use of local sales taxes for kind of general purposes of local governments because, um, you know, it creates inequities across different communities with different tax bases. So, you know, if you're in a community that has a robust retail sales base, if you're in Bloomington and you have the mall there, boy, you could put a quarter cent sales tax on that and then that city in particular really doesn't have to worry about property taxes in the same way as even a similarly kind of situated city that doesn't have that retail base. And so what we were seeing with the proliferation of these and what we are seeing again, in my opinion, is a, a, a reinforcement of spatial inequity based on tax base. And so what that means, right, is that there are situations in which you could say, if we just let these things kind of go as people want to use them, that, a, you know, a young person's access to, you know, certain kinds of capital facilities that, that provide them with enrichment in their lives could depend on the accident of where they were born, the accident of whether they happen to live in a city that has a robust sales tax, sales tax base or does not. And so that is the question that is really bef before us and that it's hard to get us to the level of thinking like that because frankly, we're all here <laughs> to do a job for our local communities and a lot of times that includes like, hey, our local communities need to build this thing, they need to provide this service, we are here to try to help them. Um, what I'm asking us to do is really to, to, to try to take a step back and to look at the bigger picture and to look at the entire system and to ask ourselves, are we interested in pursuing a future in our state which flies in the face of the way that we have historically dealt with tax revenue, which is to say, we're actually going to say no to that question. We're going to say that we believe that all people across the state should have access to equitable access to facilities that they need and that their local governments need. And it shouldn't be an accident of whether they have a rich property tax base, a rich sales tax base that folks who, who, who don't live close to those things, they still should, should be able to build facilities that their communities need. And by allowing the unfettered proliferation of local sales taxes, we're moving in a different direction than that. So I, I apologize, that was a lengthy answer, but it sort of got a little bit more into the, the meat of this, uh, the effort that's in front of the committee today. 
Uh, thank you. I, I think it's a fair statement to say that no matter where you live in our state, you should have a high quality of life. Absolutely. I agree with that statement. <laughs> Representative Carter, did you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Cleaborn and Representative Gomez. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a question, but maybe we need to look at taxes in a broader, broader base. We have uh, so many jurisdictions that are being allowed to tax uh, <coughs> that it does seem in some ways a little bit unfair. And the reason why I say that is sometimes if I go to whatever retail place or whatever, I'm paying the state sales tax. Okay, then depend upon where now I got a metro sales tax, and then I have a county sales tax, and then I have uh, a city sales tax. And, it, and in some respects, it just seems a little unfair that I'm being taxed four or five times for the same for the same product. And maybe we need to look at a broader um, way as to how we tax the people of, of the city or of the state. And, and sometimes for your local jurisdictions, as a former county commissioner, you can you can paint things a certain way to make it look, you know, pretty good. Yes, we do need this. And then they'll say, uh, if we tax this, you know, that'll keep your levy down. But that doesn't always necessarily happen, uh, that people get taxed on whatever level. And our levies don't seem to be held down low. They continue to seem to rise. So that's just my comment is that maybe we need to look at a broader area as to how we tax the people of the state. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Carter. Representative Herr. Thank you, uh, Chair Cleveland and uh, Representative Gomez. Uh, Chair Gomez, thank you so much for bringing this bill forward. I was part of um, property taxes when we implemented some of these items back in 2019. So I really appreciate, because you know we didn't know the solution back then, what would be the right thing, but we just knew we needed to get a handle and sort of understanding all of the things coming through. So I really appreciate your attempt to. Um, Try, you know, after seeing how it's worked for a number of years to say what are ways that we can adjust, you know, what we're trying to do. Right? So I really I just want to say thank you for doing that. I just had a quick question. I know you came to me yesterday and I probably should have looked at this a little bit more and have a conversation with you. Maybe you and I can just talk off base of this, but I just want to make sure because I know some of these items like convention centers, libraries, parks, sports, we also fund some of these through like public dollars, whether it's bonding or whether it's through legacy. And so is our intention then is with allowing um, localities to do some of this is that then they, uh, you know they won't be coming back and asking in these other areas to for, for bonding or for legacy money or things like that because then you know I think we people have the opportunity to actually um, tax on these themselves will that free up funds for other projects in these other pools of funds I was just curious your thoughts of, about that chair Gomez chair Cleavor and representative her that's a very very good question and you know I'll say that um, I am uh, I feel like it, it's sort of like trying to, to um, get my arms around that. What I have noticed is, you know, bonding projects require a local match. A lot of times what you will see is a community comes in for the bonding project. If this, this just to be, is if they have a really good lobbyist, okay? They come in with their bonding project. They come in with their local uh, their local tax to meet the the local match the local sales tax to meet the local match required. They'll come in with a request also in my committee for um, a construction sales tax materials exemption. Um, they'll come in with a request for a TIF district. It, these these tools and and they're and honestly like I'm just we don't have a comprehensive way that we look at these things. To your point, we do not. We don't have. Uh, you know, I've never served on the bonding committee. Our committees meet at the same time, so there isn't even any overlap between our two committees, for example. Um, and so, you know, I mean, in terms of like whether we are doing the thing that we should do as policymakers, which is take a step back, look at a system, look at what the requests, the kind of requests that are coming in from local communities, and see what state tools we have across the enterprise to meet those needs. Absolutely, that's not happening right now. And my bill doesn't solve that. I'm just going to be honest. Um, it's something that this this is just this has been a really hard thing. These little changes that I made. I mean, if we did something like that, these little changes that I made. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, boy, I heard from cities, counties, uh, all of all of their organizations. Uh, th there are letters in your brief. People are not happy about this. Democrats are not happy. Republicans are not happy. None of the cities that want to come. You know, a lot of people want to come and get these things. You know, it, it's like this is this is a, a a because we have opened kind of the floodgates in 2019, which was the first year that we allowed 
a high property tax yeah. base community to come and get a local sales tax, which, to, which as I said before, was not the convention for several decades. As soon as we made that decision, we opened the floodgates to those property wealthier communities who a lot of times can hire that really great lobbyist who can come and work all of the different levers in, 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 in the legislature. And so, you know, and that is another thing that reinforces inequities. And I mean, it, and this is not like a partisan thing, honestly, like in, I'm actually standing up mostly for GOP communities by trying to restrict the use of these in higher wealth property tax rich cities like that are now represented by Democrats. Like, so, uh, you know, this, this kind of cuts in interesting ways politically, but I mean, Representative Hurt, like you're so spot on, is that, you know, we don't, we're not like, and, and you know, this relates to, to what Representative Harder was saying, which is that, yeah, we do need to take a comprehensive look at the way that we tax people. And what the reason that we're seeing these is because if you look by any measure, if you look at percentage of GDP, if you look at percentage of local needs, a lot of you have served as local elected officials and you know that budgets are tight and that you make, you make things happen on, on really kind of tight margins because the, the, the tool that you have really is, is your property tax levy. And so when the state, which it has done, which over decades, right, our, our contribution, our, the percentage of, excuse me, that we're, of our budget that we're spending meeting the needs of local communities has just gone down and down as a state. If you look at schools, it's that way. And if you look at local governments, it's that way. Whether you're talking about LGA, CPA, you know, school aid, all of these things. And so what we're doing, right, by saying, oh, at the state level, we're going to be righteous and we're not going to pass taxes and we're not going to, like, fund government. We're just putting those hard decisions onto our local partners. By, by not doing our job, because we actually have tools that are more equitable and more progressive and less regressive than your property tax levy, than your sales taxes, because we have an income tax at the state level, which means that we're able, by using a progressive revenue tool like the income tax, then we're able to take that burden off of local communities going to their property tax levy, coming to the legislature and saying, I want this like, weird creative use of, of these taxation tools. I want a local sales tax to, you know, to, to fund something that kind of doesn't normally fall into that area. So, you know, absolutely a comprehensive look is needed at all these issues. Representative Nadeau. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Herb, you were finished, correct? Okay. Representative Nadeau, did you have a follow-up? I, I had your name again on my list, so I just want to make sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Gomez. So, um, use of the proceeds, I'm, I'm in its subdivision, I'm in Section 5, Subdivision 3. Um, it says the political subdivision imposing the tax must not commingle revenue from a tax approved by the voters under this a previous tax. So I'm wondering why that restriction, why, why we would want to use that, put that restriction in, in there. Um, subdivision. Would you please, can you tell me which line you're on? No. Well, yes, I yeah. can. Sorry, thank you. Um, I'm on line 5.19. Thank you. I'm sorry, I made notes on, a, on, a, oh, yeah. on one that doesn't have lines. So. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, so this is actually one of the pieces that I've gotten some feedback about from um, local government partners that this, there's some challenges to this. I mean, I think that the idea was, um, you know, in including this language was really just for kind of um, clarity and saying like, hey, we're, we're approving these funds for a specific use, so we just want to make sure that the funds go to that use. Um, but again, I, you know, this is, I, I have received um, some written feedback. I'm having a meeting with uh, local governments, I think, next week on this. And this is one of the issues that they identified as being a challenge and I, you know, it's not something that I'm super attached to. I think it was just sort of, um, you know, yeah, an attempt to kind of keep things clean, but if it, if it uh, to the extent that it presents problems for, in the, re in the real world for local governments, I'm probably gonna take it out, it seems like. Okay. Representative Nadeau. And thank you, and following up on that. So, and, and just further down in subdivision five, we're capping 
um, the bill caps the total at 1%. Um, is that, that's, that's your intent? So the only way that a local unit of government could exceed that would be to use the legislative process to come in and make that request, along with the additional requirements in the new section of the law that requires adjacent counties to comment on it, identify that need. Is that correct? Chair Gomez. Chair Cleavor and Representative Nadeau, yes, that's correct. My intent was to cap this at 1%. Um, counties are allowed to impose a local sales tax for transportation, I believe, of 0.5% by right. Um, so, you know, we, when you're getting up into like adding, you know, an extra 1.52% to the sales tax, it's pretty significant. And so um, we have seen that in the past, and I did want to curb that because I think that's in plenty. Representative Nadeau, last question. Yep, thank you. And so the wheelage tax would be excluded from that 1% cap, or is that now to be included in the 1% cap? Chair Gomez, and I'll just remind everyone this is a state and local government. We are the, yeah. our primary. Sounds like a bunch of you guys want to come on, come to taxes, so you're always <laughs> welcome there. Because um, obviously, as you can tell, I keep going on. I love to talk about taxes. But um, wheelage tax, I'd have to bust out my little blue book. But I think that, you, that that refers to the county transportation tax. Right. Yeah, so Madam Chair, Representative Nadeau, the intent was for the 1% cap to be separate from the county transportation tax that's already allowed under statute by right. Thank you, and then we're going to- my final oh, question. Quickly, please, we're going to yep. wrap up this bill. And thank you. Can you spend a little bit of time talking about um, the local sales tax equal, equalization dis distributions? Um, maybe the nexus between a 1%, one, 1%, uh, I, I'm not sure what the, what the nexus is there for 1% for the auditor, um, if that's going to cover the cost, if that's going to be more than that, and then the 15% that's being distributed. Chair Gomez. So thank you. So um, we kind of started with a, an idea. Well, uh, those are two different questions and one final question. So <laughs> one percent that was there's one percent that has been collected. Um, I don't know since these things started for the Department of Revenue for their administration. We did add one percent for the auditor because we're asking the Office of the State Auditor to take on additional um, additional responsibilities here. The issue and the reason that we have uh, Section 7, where there's a direct appropriation to the state auditor, which will come out of the tax budget, um, was because, you know, as we're moving forward, it's like we're asking them to do a bunch of work. We're saying we're going to collect 1% of we don't know what, whoever shows up to do these things. And so we just needed to provide them with, you know, kind of some more um, consistent revenue, certainly, to start out with. Um, and so, you know, that's why both of those things are in there. I think the hope is that eventually the 1% will be adequate to meet the, the administrative needs of the state auditor so that it doesn't require an additional general fund <laughs> expenditure to support this program that it kind of all happens within the, uh, within the, the uh, sales taxes. Um, and then to, uh, equalization fund. So basically, you know, I talked about that issue about whether we want to be a state where your access to amenities depends on your proximity to a robust sales tax or not. Um, I don't think we want to live in that kind of state, and I think that we have a long history as a kind of on a bipartisan basis of saying that we don't want Minnesota to be a state like that. And so the equalization fund is my attempt to provide some equalization, to provide some support in a on a um, you know distributed via a needs based. Uh, um, formula to communities that don't have sales taxes that can't opt in because they don't have like retail base but you know of course those communities still have needs so that's the intent with the equalization fund madam chair and representative Nadeau. All right lead Kosnick I'm gonna let you close up now. Yeah thank you uh, kind of feel like we had a more robust discussion here in local government about taxes than we uh, had time in the tax committee. However, I am sure and certain that we will have more discussion in the tax committee. So I did kind of like your uh, previous suggestion to move it back to the tax committee, but we'll let that be. Uh, before we, we'd like to request a roll call on this, more for our members, but uh, so, and I know you're a little light on your side. We're just laying it over, so there is no vote. All right. Um, I, I guess generally, uh, I didn't talk about this in tax committee. I, I think this is from the state government perspective. This is an, shows uh, yeah. another 
another instance where w the legislature is abdicating some of its authority to the executive branch, and that's a cause for concern. Um, we're growing a little bit of bureaucracy here with adding more um, more government and, and more employees. Uh, and then, of course, it makes it easier to raise taxes. So I have uh, a lot of concerns about that. Um, Chair Gomez, uh, you know, you talked about e this equalization and opportunities uh, across the state to be equal. Um, but I would suggest that that is why we have the whole fiscal disparities uh, program and local government aid uh, coming from a city or living in a city that receives none. Um, I think th those programs were established to, to get at some of what you're doing, uh, but here we are circumventing a lot of that and um, making it easier to, to grow taxes and giving up some legislative authority. So have uh, some current concerns about that. Um, had a few other questions, but we'll just uh, move on with the agenda. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Kosnick. Closing uh, words, Chair Gomez. I uh, appreciate the time in front of the committee. Yep. Certainly the intent with the Equalization Fund is not to circumvent any of the existing um, aids to local governments that are um, you know, distributed based on need. I think my intent was just to say, to the extent that, that this is raising in 2023, what was approved was $2.5 billion in taxes outside of our system. And they're probably gonna add that to their calculation now of the uh, of the total amount of taxes that we raised, but I do want to remind everyone that those were a lot of Republican proposals in there. Um, but you know, certainly it's no, nobody's intent to circumvent those, you know, those equalization efforts. But to say that if we are going to move in the direction of approving a lot of local sales taxes, that we want to pro that we want to apply that same principle of equalization to this revenue source that we do through fiscal disparities and local government aid and CPA to other forms of revenue. And Chair Gomez, I'll just say before we uh, lay the bill over that I really appreciate your dedication to making sure that we have a state that is fair and equitable for all. Um, while you and I have had our differences and um, I do appreciate the fact that you are interested in finding a clean, fair, standard process so that everyone is treated the same. And so I do greatly appreciate the work that you do. And I know that you and I um, have a lot of agreement in a lot of places. So thank you very much for the work you do. And with that, um, House File 5336, as amended, is laid over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair.